Okay, here we are with lesson number five in our unit on mechanics. And we're shifting gears. First couple of lessons looked at motion. Um, the next few lessons we'll look at forces and Newton's laws. And today specifically, we're going to expand on our discussion of Newton's laws in, in one dimension, which we tackled in grade 11. And we're going to look at Newton's laws in two dimensions. So because dynamics is, is really the why of motion, it, it, it explains why motion happens. And it creates the connection between um, forces, acceleration rather, creates the connection between forces and kinematics. Um, really, we're going to explain the, the cause of motion rather than, rather than what happens um, when something moves. So there's a couple important definitions that we should start. These should all be review, um, because you probably would have learned these in a course in grade 11. <laughs> A force is a push or a pull in any given direction, and there are several different types we've discussed. Um, friction and gravity and the normal force. We're going to look uh, this year at the spring force or the um, restoring force, so the elastic force. We're going to look at um, e electricity and magnetism, so the electric force and the magnetic force, and so on and so forth. Um, but in general, a force is a push or a pull. Gravity is the mutual force of attraction between any two objects that contain matter. So gravity is one of those things that, you know, we really looked at last year, um, and we say, okay, well, whenever two things have matter in them, they will attract each other because of the force of gravity. A free body diagram, we got very used to drawing last year. A free body diagram is a tool that represents the forces that are acting on a given object. So when we create a free body diagram, we select an object, we represent it with a shape, and then we draw all the forces that are acting on it. It helps us formulate equations, and that is crucial. We're going to use them all the time, and so we're going to review um, how to draw these, uh, these free body diagrams as we go through our first example. Newton's laws, then, um, to summarize, um, there are three of them, and they govern classical mechanics. And his first law, which is also sometimes called his law of inertia, states that an object will remain at rest or in uniform motion unless acted on by an unbalanced external force. Newton's second law is that F net equals MA. Um, and, you know, if we want to describe this law in, um, in words, we could say that, okay, well, when you're looking at the acceleration of an object, that acceleration is directly proportional to the force, the unbalanced force that's acting on it, and the mass, and it's inversely proportional to the mass uh, that's acting on it. So F net equals MA, it's of course where we start most of our problems using Newton's laws. <laughs> Newton's third law states that for every force there's an equal and opposite reaction force. And um, we looked at this in depth last year and trying to identify action-reaction pairs. We'll do the same thing as we move through our course in grade 12. So now that we know those rules, we can describe forces such as friction, the normal force, and gravity. Those were the three main ones that we looked at last year, and let's recall them now. Specifically, the normal force and static and kinetic friction. The normal force is really the force that you get whenever an object presses down on a surface or presses into a surface. It's the action force for that, for that, um, it's, excuse me, it's the reaction force for any action force that's acting with the surface. It's always perpendicular to the surface. And um, we kind of went through those examples last year where if you, have, if you have a book sitting on the table, most of us can identify the fact that that book is pressing down on the table. Well, the book um, is also experiencing a force from the table. Right. The, the book is experiencing the force of gravity in the downwards direction. Well, it's not going anywhere. So we know that there must be an equal and opposite reaction force. That table has to be pressing back up on the book so that it doesn't move. Static and kinetic friction are, of course, tied to the normal force. Um, and that's, that's because we define friction as a force that's produced from contact between two surfaces. So because we've got two surfaces that are involved, here and here, we know that the normal force has something to do with the force of friction. 
we have two different types of friction. We have static friction, which is basically whenever two objects are at rest, it's the force of friction that's acting between them when they're at rest. Kinetic friction is the force of friction when two objects are pressing against each other, but they're in motion. Um, the coefficient of friction is, um, requires some definition here. It's simply the ratio between the normal force and the force of friction. So it's unitless, and the coefficient of friction really describes, um, it's a measure of the two surfaces that are in contact. Different surfaces will experience different forces of, fr of, of um, static and kinetic friction. And you would know that because, of course, certain things experience very little friction, perhaps a puck on ice, and certain things experience a lot of friction, you know, such as, um, you know, no, non-slip shoes and tiles in, in fast food restaurants, right? You know, certain places we want high coefficients of friction so that we don't slip around. Other places we want low coefficients of friction so that things do slip around. And this coefficient is a description of the two surfaces that are in contact. Um, we use mu s for static friction. We use mu k for kinetic friction. And these are simply the symbols that we use to describe this variable. Let's take a look at a few problems that involve Newton's laws. We're going to look at their solutions. We're going to test using some algebraic vectors. So we're going to concern ourselves with vectors in i hat and j hat um, just to save us some space and to save us some time. And always we're going to draw free body diagrams. So here's example number one. A barge is being pulled through a canal by two horses as shown in this diagram looking at the situation from the top down. Each horse here and here are, are, are applying a constant force of 5,000 newtons. This barge then moves through the water at a constant speed and we want to determine the frictional force that's acting on this boat because of the water. So, let's take a look at what's happening. We need to draw our free body diagram. And in this case, we'll represent the barge by a circle. Horse 1 produces F1, horse 2 produces F2. And of course, the friction we know is going to be in a direction to oppose the motion. Um, the friction always opposes slipping. And because this boat is not going to simply slip through the water, friction acts in a, in a way um, that it, it is opposite to the motion of this boat, okay? A couple of notes. Constant speed, as always, implies that acceleration is equal to zero. Um, and this has implications when we attempt to define F equals MA, because really the sum of all these forces then, the sum of F1, the sum of F2, and the force of friction equals zero. So they're, they're in balance with each other. And here's, of course, F net. Now, the difference between this year and last year is that last year, in, in a course, in a very introductory course in physics, F1, F2, and friction would have all been in one direction. So the either the x direction or the y direction. But we can see these two vectors are not in just one direction. They're in both the i hat and the j hat direction. And so we need to correct for that. We need to figure out, OK, well, how are we going to sum up all these vectors? And of course, the answer is simply vector addition between these three vectors. So let's take a look at f1, and we'll take a look at f2. So here's f1. We know the angle that it's acting. It's at 40 degrees. That would have been something given in the problem. And we know its magnitude, 5,000 newtons. So the question becomes, can we resolve this vector into its i hat and j hat component? And the answer is, you bet we can. We simply take our um, sine ratio and our cosine ratio, and we can write F1 as 5,000 cos 40 i hat plus 5,000 sine 40 j hat. We'll take a look then at force 2. 
which is in the um, which is in a similar direction in x, the same direction in x, but it's in the downwards direction in j, which is a little bit different than force one. And so because it has the same magnitude and the same angle, we can write F2 as 5,000 cos 40 i hat minus 5,000 sine 40 j hat. And the reason we put the minus sign here is simply because this is acting in the downwards direction. And we've defined up as our positive. Okay? So looking at these two things then, we can say, all right, well, we know that F1 plus F2 plus the force of friction is equal to zero. And we say, all right, let's add these two vectors together. And here they are. We can move the force of friction to the other side, which gives it a negative sign. And we can take force one and force two and write them as such. When we expand these brackets and we collect our i hat terms and our j hat terms, remember, i hats have to stay separate from j hats. They represent different directions. What we get is that the force of friction is equal to negative 2 times 5,000 cos 40 i hat. We get a 5,000 cos 40 i hat here and a 5,000 cos 40 i hat here. And we put those two together. And of course, it's 2 times 5,000 cos 40 i hat. And when we multiply this out, we get the force of friction is equal to negative 7,660 i hat newtons. Of course, the question is, what happened to the j-hats? And if you were paying attention to their signs, we've got plus 5,000 sine 40 j-hat, and we've got minus 5,000 sine 40 j-hat here. And of course, those two things cancel out. So the force of friction, as it turns out, is in the x direction only. All right, onwards. Mr. Worf on the Starship Enterprise accidentally fires two rockets on his shuttlecraft at the same time. The first rocket applies a force of 1,000 newtons east 25 degrees south. The second rocket applies a force of 1,200 newtons north 40 degrees west. If the shuttlecraft has a mass of 5.0 times 10 to the fourth kilograms, determine the acceleration it will experience. All right, so free body diagram. Here is the shuttlecraft, this little circle, and we know that the first force is down here, 1,000 newtons, and it's east, but then 25 degrees to the south. The second force is 1,200 newtons, and it's north, 40 degrees to the west. So here's our two forces that are going to act to create an acceleration. And what we can say is that, well, we know F net equals MA. So you'll notice that, you know, doing these, these types of problems, we always start with a free body diagram, and we write F net equals MA. And going from there, we can say, okay, well, let's resolve force one. We get 1,000 newtons. It's at, acting at 25 degrees. Force one is 1,000 cos 25 in the I hat direction minus 1,000 sine 25 in the j hat direction. The negative sign indicates that it's downwards. We're assuming a standard sign convention that up is positive. And so I should say in this case, north would be positive and east would be positive, just like in the Cartesian coordinate system. Okay, so let's look at the second force, 1,200 newtons. And when we resolve this, we get negative 1,200 newtons sine 40 i hat because it's in the negative direction. And we get plus 1,200 cos 40 in the j hat direction because it's up. And so really, the sum of the forces are F net is equal to F1 plus F2, and that's equal to MA. And when we sum these two forces, this is what we get. We get 1,000 cos 25 i hat minus 1,000 sine 25 j hat. We get minus 1,200 sine 40 i hat plus 1,200 cos 40 j hat. We've simply taken our two forces and we've substituted them into our equation that we, that we would have had from the free body diagram. Keeping i hat separate and j hat separate, we can simplify 
and we will arrive at 135 i hat plus 497 j hat is equal to ma. When we divide by the mass, watch what happens. We get basically 135 again. We have to keep i hat and j hat neg um, separate. And we get 2.7 times 10 to the negative 3 i hat plus 9.9 .9 times 10 to the negative 3 j hat. And we leave it in meters per second squared. Because we're working with component vectors, we're not going to turn this back um, into a magnitude and a direction. All the information we have is in i hat and j hat. We, of course, could say what's the magnitude of this acceleration, and we would then go and calculate using the Pythagorean theorem. We could also say what angle is this acceleration acting at, and we could use that again, um, you know, use a, a triangle trigonometry, very simple triangle trigonometry, and find out the angle that this is working at. But we don't have to, and this is why we like i hat and j hat, because we can just leave it in this form, and we're done. All right, so example number three of four, two blocks of mass five kilograms and two kilograms are placed in contact with each other on a frictionless horizontal surface. A constant horizontal force is applied to the five kilogram mass, find the acceleration of the blocks, and the magnitude of the contact forces between the blocks. Now, this is a one-dimensional force problem. But it's so important that I decided to introduce it here. Um, this, is, this is a very standard action-reaction, Newton's third law type of question from grade 11. Very standard, but it's crucial. And for some reason, there's a lot of students in grade 11 that don't ever get this concept. And so I wanted to revisit this idea here and now to take a look at how we do these types of problems. Because we'll probably see them again. Now, if I'm applying a force of 70 newtons here, and I got a 5 kilogram and a 2 kilogram, these two blocks accelerate together because they're in contact with each other. The 5 kilogram block is going to push the 2 kilogram block along, and they're not going to do anything wonky. Like, this 2 kilogram block isn't going to fly off in front. They're going to accelerate together as one unit. And we can exploit that to try and figure out their accelerations because if they move together they have the same acceleration. So we turn to F net equals MA. And we say, okay, well, if we look at these two things as a package, then M in this becomes M1 plus M2. And the force is 70 newtons. The mass of the two blocks is seven kilograms. The acceleration becomes 10 meters per second squared. Simple enough. We've just determined the magnitude of the acceleration. We've also actually determined the direction of the acceleration. It's going to be in the same direction as the force. But now we need to turn our attention to the contact forces in between the blocks. So the first step is done. We figure out what the acceleration is. To figure out the contact force in between them, we now don't want to look at them accelerating together because, of course, contact forces are equal and opposite. And when we look at them as a package, when we look at these two things as a package, any forces that are in between here just cancel each other out because they're equal and opposite. But if we look at each of these masses individually now, we can say, oh yeah, we've got a 70 Newton force acting on mass 5, but hey, we've got the contact force from the two kilogram block, F2, and he's pushing back in this opposite direction. So we can say, all right, well, let's do F net equals MA again, but only for this block. So here I've got 70 minus the force of friction from block two equals MA. A is 10 because I just solved for it up here. I can figure this out and determine that F2 is equal to 20 newtons. And it would be in the opposite direction to this 70 newton force. Let's do a quick check, because if I found out that F2 is 20 newtons, then F5 
the force from the 5 kilogram block had better be 20 newtons as well. Because if we're saying that they're equal and opposite, they better in fact be, and our math better work out. So here's F net equals MA for this block. The only force that's acting on this one, because this 70 newton force is not acting on this block, it's not even touching it. The only force it's acting is the push that it gets from F5, and that's equal to MA. So this becomes very, very straightforward, and we get 20 newtons, which results from 2 times 10. And we can say then that this is good, because we know that F2 acted in the negative direction, F5 acted in the positive direction. Their magnitudes are equal, they're equal and opposite. That's a very standard example of a Newton's third law question. Last question in this lesson. Hockey puck frozen pond on a frozen pond is hit and given an initial velocity of 20 meters per second. The puck always remains on the surface of the ice and it slides 115 meters before coming to rest. What's the coefficient of kinetic friction between the puck and the ice? This is another very, very typical and very standard grade 11 question that involves the normal force and gravity and friction and kinematics. And in a couple of days in class, what we're going to do is we're going to work on these types of problems so that we can arrive at a description of something very similar to this but in two dimensions rather than just in one. For now, we're going to review this in one dimension. Here's the puck. Our positive direction is going to be set as usual according to the Cartesian coordinate system. We know the V1 of this puck is 20 meters per second. We know the distance that it travels is 115 meters. And we know that eventually it comes to rest. We'd like to determine, given these parameters, what the acceleration is. Because, of course, that's always what we're looking for when we turn a force problem into a kinematics problem or when we turn a kinematics problem into a force problem. We're looking for A, which is the connection between those two worlds. So here we'll skip to equation number five in our kinematics inventory and we can simply sub in our numbers and we will see that acceleration is equal to negative 1.74 meters per second squared. So acceleration is actually working backwards. Now it comes time to investigate our dynamics and of course how do we start? When we look at dynamics we draw a free body diagram. So as this puck is sliding along the ice these are the forces that are acting on it. We've got the normal force, we've got the force of gravity, those are up and down, and we've got the force of friction. You'll notice there is not a force acting over here. Just because something's sliding along the ice in one direction does not mean that there's a force pushing it. Very common misconception. The only force that's acting is the force of friction, and of course it's acting in the same direction as the acceleration. It's slowing this puck down. So F net equals MA, and we get that the force of friction is equal to mass times acceleration. We know the mass of the puck. We know the acceleration of the puck. And we know that the frictional force, the force of friction, is equal to mu times the normal. So replacing this with mu times Fn, we can simply say, all right, what is the normal force that acts on this puck? We can look in the y direction to determine that. Of course, this puck is not accelerating in the y direction. So we say, all right, well, the normal force then has to equal gravity because it's not acting in the y direction. And we have here mu k is equal to mg, which is equal to ma. We never even needed the mass of the puck because on this side it'll cancel with this side. The acceleration of this puck is equal to mu times g, and we can simply solve this way, bringing our acceleration into here. 
and it turns out that mu is equal to 0 0.177. All right, more on this in class.